Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know. I it was. It was. I couldn't imagine that. Oh. And I mean, I oh. <laughs> you, you'd, be so there, you'd be there for nine, out, ten hours after oh, yeah. your appointments and stuff. Oh, that would suck. That would suck. But the, the Dara sub Q. Yeah, that sub Q was, was a lot nice. Yeah. 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 I said, I told them. They I waited said, like a half hour or something. Didn't they, didn't they, they wait? the first time. They waited. See, Northside is waiting, or Annie Kanske is waiting all the time. That extra time. Yeah, they would give it to me, and I could get up. And I'd usually sit there for 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And then I'd, I'd pack my shit up and leave. I never, like, needed a ride or something. You know, I always could drive home and stuff. Even though they gave me Benadryl, I used to suffer. Benadryl. 30 minutes. Yeah, but, but, see, I'm doing decks. And Benadryl at the same time. Me dose. too. And, and I would usually, the, 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 the Benadryl would win for about 30 minutes. Which one did you do the first? Um, did they do the same one first all the time? Dex or Benadryl? You know? No, they, uh, they, they gave me the one shot. Oh, at the same time? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they did second. So I do. I, and now. I think I always did the Dex first. The, they were, I had some late afternoon appointments. Yeah. Uh, in this first cycle. They're taking the decks at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Hard. Oh. Hard that night. Oh. So I just finally, sleeping. now just hard on me because I don't just be sweating. Oh, yeah. So I talked to Rosie one time and said, oh, she wrote me another prescription. So I take four in the morning and then I only get one at the time of the fusion. Because the car feels them bad because you do decks with them. She said, if I don't give you at least one, the nurse is getting all concerned because you're not your text with the cartels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm right, so I, I'm getting 20, so I'm doing four and then more and then a four, one by itself. Yeah, yeah. Excited to have you join us today in person. And uh, my name is Brian Daly. I'm a National Community Outreach Manager for the Human Lymphoma Society. And I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Nisha Joseph. Uh, Dr. Joseph is an associate professor in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology in Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Joseph was named the first H. Gene Corey Fellow in uh, Leukemia and Bone Marrow Transplant. Board certified in hematology and medical oncology. He specializes in plasma and hematology and medical oncology. Uh, bone marrow and bone marrow transplant, rather. Dr. Joseph received her medical degree from the Ohio State University School of Medicine in Columbus, Ohio. And she completed both her residency in internal medicine and her fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at Emory University where she served as chief fellow in her final year. Dr. Joseph, will you take it from here? <laughs> All right, good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, appreciate um, you being here and I hope the next, uh, you know, we're with each other for the next hour or so. Um, and so really, I've done these before, and I, the whole the only reason I'm here is to make sure you get the information you came here for, you get the answers uh, to the questions that you have. And um, I've kind of, they've asked us, and the way I've written this is to focus on some of the newer stuff. 
So, um, and, I, and we can structure this however you know you want, really. So um, the way, let's see, the way I kind of structure this is that we'll start with newly diagnosed myeloma. Um, in my experience, folks who come to this are, are well equipped and kind of know the basics. So I, I'm not going to go over that, but uh, I'm happy to. If you raise, you know, if, if you're comfortable raising your hand, I'm happy to to explain anything I'm saying. There are some recent, um, you know, advancements and changes in how we approach the diagnosed myeloma. So I just want to go over that for both transplant eligible and ineligible. Um, I, I know there's a mix of patients. Some are, are earlier in their course, and some have had myeloma for 15, 20 years and beyond, which is amazing. Um, so I'll try to kind of move through that in the first 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll talk about some of the newer drugs um, in the relapsed refractory setting of the night. Though I don't have a ton of slides on it, <clears throat> I will, I'm happy to talk about what's on the horizon, what's coming down the pipe. Because if you've been in the myeloma world long enough, you know that every year we have something new, you know, which is amazing. Right? Things are moving so quickly. And when people in my clinic, when I see newly diagnosed folks, ask me, well, what will you do when this comes back? I tell them the honest question is, I do not know. Right? I do not know what we will do because the average remission is five, six, seven years for a newly diagnosed patient. And who knows what we will do because things are moving so rapidly, which I think is um, exciting, certainly um, as someone who, who treats the disease. And I hope you feel that way too. Um, <clears throat> so before I even get going, if you're comfortable, because um, I really want to make sure I answer the questions that you have, if you're comfortable kind of shouting out, it doesn't have to be specific questions, but things that are burning on your mind, things that you're hoping I touch on today. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if someone is predisposed to having multiple myelomas uh -huh. and have been told that they have an 1% increased risk uh -huh. of actually developing it, what are some things that you can do preventatively? Okay, it's a great question. So the question was about if I'm at risk for developing myeloma, what can I do? So that's not in, I don't focus a lot on smoldering today in MDES. Happy to talk about that um, if we have time at the end or personally. Anything else? Okay, all right, good. Oh, yes, yes. The difference in the treatments in the past two years. Okay, so I think we'll touch on that. Mm -hmm. Difference in treatments in the past two years? Yes, ma'am. What are why do people relapse? Okay. We can talk about that. Yes, ma'am. Is this run in the family? Okay. So maybe we'll start there and just talk about myeloma for a second. Does it run in the family? Anybody else? Yes, sir. What causes? So we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk with about cause. Yes, sir. Maintenance. 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 Yep. We'll talk about maintenance. That I have in here so far. I have one thing that has been raised so far. Anything else? Yes, sir. In the back. How can we educate our family and caregivers? So the first thing, I'm gonna start with that question, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the epi of myeloma, and then we'll get into treatment. I think you being here is the answer to that question. There are so many LLS seminars, MMRF seminars, webinars, Facebook Live, Onc Live. Um, most of us spend our weekends doing these kind of things. And I hope that you find them informative. And the goal is to educate you about the kind of the behind the scenes and take time to hopefully dive into things that we don't always have time for maybe in the exam room. I hope you feel that way. So let's talk a little bit about um, the epidemiology of myeloma. So myeloma historically um, is a cancer of folks in their 60s to 70s. The median age of diagnosis is around 67. It is more common in men. It tends to be more common in the black community. We do not have great reasons to understand why people get it and why people do not. It is not the cancer we think of is hereditary, okay? Now there is a slight increased risk if you have a family member, but that is a mix of, I think, genetic predisposition and environmental exposure, right? Because family members tend to live or be raised in the same place. So they have the same type of environmental exposure. Um, what can we do? I think that the question was, how do I get it? We don't really know. There are, there are studies, there are population-based studies that look at exposure 
to harmful substances in our environment. So things like radiation exposure, chemical exposure, organic solvents. So folks who've worked in chemical plants their whole life. Uh, folks who um, have been uh, uh, exposed to pesticides or organophosphates or people who work military. in military. In agriculture, military, there's a clear link there. Unfortunately, people who are exposed uh, to Agent Orange and other things in the military, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, we have several folks who are 9-11 uh, first responders, unfortunately, um, who had inhalation exposure at that time. So there are links there, but you do not have to have that clear link uh, to develop myeloma. The real answer is we do not always know. Um, there is some data about the gut microbiome that's coming out in terms of in MGUS and smoldering, which are pre-myelomas and looking at preventing or delaying um, the initial event that caused that abnormal clonoplasma cells and looking at plant-based diet and, and lifestyle modifications and things like that. Um, but we don't, have, we don't have clear evidence to say, if you do this, you will not get myeloma, okay? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about treatment now. <clears throat> Please feel free to interrupt me, and then I will, um, have my phone here, so it's 1.23. I will try to finish with at least 10, 15 minutes so we can go through questions. If I don't hit them, I'll try to hit them as we go through. So for newly diagnosed myeloma, we're gonna talk about what's the current standard of care for transplant eligible or fit patients, what's the current standard of care of transplant ineligible, and we'll talk a little bit about optimal maintenance. How do we decide on that? So the thing to understand about myeloma is that even though unfortunately it is not yet curable, we are working on it, we have turned it into more of a chronic disease, okay? And people live with myeloma, and I'm sure many people in this room are a testament to that, for 15, 20 years and beyond. And for a disease, I tell folks where the average age of diagnosis is folks in their 60s and 70s, my absolute goal is to get you as close to your normal lifespan as your normal lifespan as possible. The way we get there is by inducing nice, long remissions, right? Which makes sense, if the disease is gonna come back, the longer we can kick that can down the road before it comes back, the better someone is gonna do overall. Statistically speaking, your first remission tends to be your longest, not always, but statistically speaking. So that's why we try to be the most aggressive upfront if you are um, otherwise fit and able to undergo those treatments. So I'm gonna start with transplant eligible. And the way we treat transplant eligible patients, it tends to be younger, but not always. There's no age cutoff at Emory. The, the, uh, most seasoned patient we have uh, transplanted was 80. It's really more about your performance status, your other health problems, how fit you are. And we think about it in three phases, induction, consolidation is the transplant, meaning trying to drive that initial response home and then maintenance therapy, right? So getting a deep response and keeping it. So let's talk a little bit about what has changed um, in, in uh, induction therapy recently. You might have seen this, particularly for a patient of sagarolonials or heard this analogy. We think of uh, myeloma as an iceberg. There is what you can see above the surface, but a majority of it is below the surface, unfortunately. We're getting more and more sensitive tests to measure that. You might have heard a minimal residual disease or MRD, right? So that you're getting towards the, the bottom of the iceberg there. Um, but people often ask, well, if you give me induction therapy, if you give me this therapy, and now you can't measure my myeloma protein anymore, why are you gonna make me go through a transplant? And the reason is, just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And the more of that iceberg I kill, the longer it's gonna take for that iceberg to build back up, right? That's kind of the, the basic mechanism. In terms of why do I relapse, myeloma cells, plasma cells, normal plasma cells, are part of your immune system. They harbor antibody response, antigenic memory of things, bad things in your body that your body's been exposed to, and they're supposed to live forever. So they can remember if you're ever exposed to that again, and they can help kill it. So biologically, plasma cells are designed to live. They're very hard to kill. And I kind of call them the cockroach of the mirror. We could wipe it out, and then we're gonna find one sucker in the corner. And that's why it comes back, right? Because we'll, we'll kill as much as we can, there's gonna be something left over. Eventually, it's gonna find a way around the drugs we're giving it, and you're gonna relapse. So that's why we talk about the natural history is that it's gonna unfortunately come back, okay? So how do we optimize that depth and duration of response? So induction therapy is that initial therapy we give. I, I think a lot of people might be past this, so I, I'll try to move quickly through this, but we're trying to maximize your initial depth of response. I tell people when you're, you're newly diagnosed disease, I wanna give you therapy to help you feel better kill as much as we can as possible, reverse whatever has been done. So if you have kidney damage, you have anemia, 
is a bone lesion, we try to reverse that, right, and make you feel better quickly. So historically, what we have done at Emory and, and most uh, sites around the country is a regimen called RVD. Who's heard of RVD before? Yeah. So RVD stands for Revlimid or Lenalidomide, Valcade or Bortezomib, and Dexamethasone. So we gave this for a long time until about 2018, where we started adding a drug called Daratumumab. And I'll go through some of the data as to why. Daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody. It's now a shot. It used to be given IV for folks who've had it. Uh, several years ago, but now it's a, sub a shot, subcutaneous shot been given the fat of the belly. So we have actually looked, this is data that I had published, um, I guess four years ago now, where we looked, many of you in this room are part of this curve. Um, where we looked at a thousand patients at Emory that we transplanted with RBD, transplant and maintenance, and we looked at their remission times. And I just want you to remember the earliest patient here was 2006. So I don't want you to get too uh, you know, into the numbers. We're getting better, better and better with each passing year. But you can see at that, particularly at that time, this is pretty impressive remission times and overall survival for a disease that back, you know, in the 90s and when I was in medical school, we were talking about two to three years. So this is very impressive. This is the first time this was shown in a large population study where if you have standard risk myeloma, your average remission time, PFS, progression-free survival, essentially means that first remission was almost seven years, right, almost seven years. Survival for standard risk patients were not bad. High risk patients, three and a half years for first remission, about seven and change years. And again, we have improved upon that, okay? But this was very impressive at the time. So the Griffin study was the initial phase two study that added their tumor map to RBD. And just to quickly go through it, in blue, you can see the depth of response was higher, meaning we're killing more myeloma with the addition of daratumumab, and daratumumab is a very well-tolerated drug. Hopefully, if you've had it, you feel that way. It, there, are, there are things that happen, of course, with any drug, but in general, compared to other things um, we, we can give you, it's pretty well-tolerated. So we're not adding a lot of toxicity, but we're adding benefit, right? And then when we look at survival or remission times, I'm gonna show you a lot of these curves, and basically, the top curve is better. Right? Whatever curve is on top is better. If the curves overlap, um, then there's no difference. And you can see DARE RVD is higher than RVD. So the average survival has not been reported in this study, but if the follow-up of almost 50 months, at four years, more people had not progressed on DARE RVD than RVD. So 87% versus 70%, okay? Because of initial early experience we had with DARE RVD, we actually started using it at Emory back in 2018, many years before this study the Perseus study came out. So this was presented at ASH, I'm losing track of time, uh, 2023, so last ASH. That's our annual meeting uh, every December. So the Perseus study was the randomized phase three. So phase three means now we're taking, this is kind of the last step before we say, well, this might be standard of care. So we're taking this new regimen, comparing it to the old regimen in a randomized setting, right? So the computer randomizes you to one or the other. Which one is better? It's kind of the gold standard in our world. And when they compared DARA RVD versus RVD in the phase with Perseus study, again, you can see very similar results to what they saw in the Griffin study. People do better, right? We got longer emissions, deeper responses with DARA RVD. And this is the survival. Some people uh, talk about, oh, well, there's no survival difference. You can see how I talked about those curves are kind of close. It's very hard to call a survival benefit in a disease where people live for 20 plus years, okay? So in time, I think this will change. So just because there's no survival benefit with this early bulk, we don't, we don't think that means DARA isn't beneficial. Okay, so we still give DARA RVD up front. Um, this is showing depth of response. The red is DARA RVD, right? So the higher bar means more people are getting, are getting killing of more myeloma. So we're killing more myeloma, we're getting longer remissions. And this slide is to show you that that benefit favors DARA RVD across different subgroups, meaning it doesn't matter your age or your ethnic background, what stage you have, what high risk, uh, if you have high risk disease versus standard risk disease, you do better with their RVD, okay? So this has become a standard of care for us. I'm just gonna skip ahead. Um, and we went ahead, since we changed in 2018, we've had to date almost 600 patients that we've treated at Emory with their RVD. And so a few years ago, I presented this data where I took 325 of some of you and 1,000 of our RVD and I compared them. 
to see, okay, fine, in a clinical trial, you're telling me that people do better with their RVD, but I think as we all know, at other centers outside of Emory, we're, we're the exception, clinical trials are not usually representative of the, of the actual population, certainly not our population here. So I wanted to see, does it actually make a difference in the, the real world clinical setting? And I'll just highlight here that this, this is the main thing I'm highlighting, right? So across the country, <clears throat> on clinical trials, it's improving. About 5, 10% of patients are black. In Perseus, it was 1%. In our data set, it's around 40%. So I think that's important and helpful to make sure that we're um, doing something that is beneficial for everybody. So even in our data set, we're seeing that uh, you have a higher depth of response in DARA RVD, both post-induction and post-transplant. And this is a survival. So it's very early. I've, I've updated this. I'm going to present it at IMS and hopefully ASH uh, later this year. Um, so we only had about two years of follow-up at this time, but you can see the blue curve is higher, right? So DARA RVD is doing better in terms of remission and survival, um, even in our Emory rural or clinical practice. So this is one of the major changes, and this is showing you by race as well. This is one of the major changes someone asked in two years. I would say if, if you're treated at other centers, if you're treated in the community, it always lags behind a little bit, but newly diagnosed myeloma, in my opinion, should be treated with DARA RVD, or quadruplet regimen, if you're transplant eligible. Okay. Questions about any of that? Okay. Um, a few other things that were presented at ASH. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it must be skin, right? Yeah. So I'm talking about the treatment that he got before transplant. So it's not something we're giving him right now. So you know, before transplant, we give you what we call induction. Oh, shots, shots and pills. Shots yes, ma'am. Correct. Correct. Yep. You know, if he was induced four or five years ago at Emory or someone else, somewhere else. At Emory, he was induced. He got DARA RVD. Okay. Yep. 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 RVD. RVD. Yes, sir. Yes, it's a good question. So the question was, can I change if I've already started RVD? So I, I, that's a question. We could talk about that after. I think if you're already through it now, I don't want to say RVD is not effective. It's effective. You're not getting bad therapy. We're just trying to improve some it. So if you have, if you've done one cycle of RVD and I see someone in my clinic, I'll, I'll ask their local, if they're community oncologists, to add DARA. If you have gotten through most of your induction with RVD, I wouldn't delay transplant to give yourself DARA. What we have then done, and actually what they did in the Perseus trial, is they gave DARA in the maintenance space with Revlimid. And so for folks that I've seen that did not get DARA up front, I give them DARA on the back end. So I would push on. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, if you've had a week, sure, add it, right? Or talk to your doc about adding it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, delay anything. We can make up for it later. Make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Should you then ask your doctor for that DRVD, even if you were on RVD? Should I, should I, should you ask your doctor for the DRVD? Yes. I think it, yes. I think it's standard of care to have a quadruplet regimen. And one thing I think is an aside, I think it's always helpful, you know, we have a very large, um, if you live, I'm assuming people live here in the Atlanta area or in the Georgia area, you have the benefit of having a very large myeloma center, the largest myeloma center in the Southeast here in Atlanta. And so one thing I think is beneficial is to partner with us. So you don't need to come to Atlanta. I know a lot of people hate Atlanta, <laughs> hate Atlanta traffic, I get it. You don't have to come to Atlanta for treatment. But I would highly encourage you to come see one of us. There's, there's now seven of us. We just had a new member join. Um, and, and, and we can help. You know, can help partner with your community oncologist. My mother's a community oncologist. I have incredible respect for what they do. It's hard to keep up with everything. 
And so we're here as a resource, right, to help guide. So that's, I think, another, um, another thing I would recommend in general, if you have a family member or yourself. Yes, yes. It's a good it's a good question so there's a longer answer to that and if, I'm happy to explain it so um, in the analysis that we did at Emory we don't routinely give DARA in maintenance so when we compared our data with Perseus the progression free survival was very similar and there's a trial called the Cassiopeia trial that was done in Europe where they compared VTD so thalidomide is an older version of replement with and without DARA, and there was a sub-analysis where they looked at patients who either got DARA in induction or DARA in maintenance. And it didn't matter when you got it, they had very similar PFS. So I'm extrapolating from other studies, and, and the Perseus study would, would probably, authors of that study would say you need DARA in both settings, and I think most of us at Emory think we're not sure yet. We're not sure yet. And so from extrapolation of that data, that's why we're recommending if you didn't get it up front, it's reasonable to get it on the back end. If you didn't get it at all, do not panic. People still do very well, and that means you have DARA later. That's all, right? Okay. Anything else? Do you all part and ship with George and his system? All the time. Yeah, all the time. There's not a group you can mention that I haven't worked with, or one of us has a and most people are, most of your docs are very receptive to that. Now, again, we're not here to take over anything. We're just here to help give advice. Okay, because that's, this is the first time I've heard about this DLS. Okay. Yep. So I'm not here to tell you about that. It's okay. It's okay. Like I said, there are many ways to do this, and there are ways to still make it up, okay? There is a good drug. I mean, the thing about myeloma, because it's not curable, you're gonna see these drugs at some point. That's the reality, right? We haven't lost an opportunity. All we can try to do is make the best of each scenario. So if you are DARA sensitive, meaning you've never had DARA tumor map, that you have, you have that benefit at relapse. So it will be okay. Yes, sir. Do you need new patients? Yes, yes. We have, um, yes, there's seven of us. We, we're happy to see you at any time. Yes. I have just one more question. Yes. Is it possible to combine DARA and Revenue, or is it one or the other? I'm sorry. So this regimen is DARA RVD. All four. All four. So the old regimen was RVD. So nothing very, well, that's not true, but for the most part in myeloma, more is better. For the most part. We always tend to combine things. And the reason we do that is because plasma cells are smart. And so when you use drugs that work on different pathways, you're making it harder for that cell to figure it out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're using a drug that kills the myeloma cell this way, and it figures it out, well tough, I'm coming this way to kill you too, right? So if you look historically in myeloma, we've, we've used doublets or in the past, that went away. Now, then we use triplets, which is RVD. And then now we're doing quads. I hope that's the end because Good goodness, that's a lot of drugs. But you know, we keep adding, <clears throat> and even in the relapse setting, I see you one sec. Even in the relapse setting, drugs are often approved as monotherapy. So even daratumumab was initially approved as a single agent, right? That was looked at as single agent and relapse. But then we learn how to combine them. So I'm gonna show you my specific data, which is one of the newer classes of drugs. And um, we're now in clinical trial combining them with Revlimid and Pomalimid and daratumumab. Right, so it, um, okay. it's always, it tends to be always in combination. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's usually, a, it's usually considered a doublet. So if you had Valdex, that's usually a doublet. VTD or RVD is a triplet. Yeah, I mean, right. I think the thing is, because things change so quickly, you 
you'll find if you talk to someone who was treated in 2010, 2014, 2016, they might have gotten different therapies. And I also just want to remind those of you who, are, who are, might have upset, this is statistics. This is not you. Right? So some people can get very little therapy and be in deep remission for a long time. So please just take this as what it is, which is statistical randomized trials. You are your own person. And everyone responds differently to the therapy. That's the truth. Yes? With these medications and my medication, are there any side effects? Yeah. Are there side effects of therapy? So that's actually what I was getting at, is when we looked at the quad, the main question or the goal in my mind is to maximize efficacy while minimizing toxicity. Because the reality is we could make these very big regimens, right? But that's gonna be hard on you. That's gonna be hard on the patient. And so I, I skipped through it because I'm gonna run out of time by a lot. But uh, when we looked at safety, there was not a significant difference. So Dara, there is, there is, if anyone's been on Belcade, there are side effects of Belcade. There's neuropathy, if anyone's been on a problem with it. There's diarrhea, you can feel tired. There's a risk of blood clots. Steroids make people <coughs> feel horrible sometimes, or great, but then horrible, right? Dara is usually not the one I get complaints about. Yeah. So that's kind of the benefit, that you can add Dara and get that benefit, but you're not adding a type of toxicity. Yes? Yeah, so thank you. So a very common reaction of daratumumab is an infusion reaction. Daratumumab is an antibody, so it's an immune therapy. So when, it's, when it enters your system, your immune system is saying, what is that? So it's, it's not uncommon, although now that it's given as a shot, it's different, but it's not uncommon to have a reaction of what we call an injection site reaction. It's usually redness, pain, irritation. People can get hives, but the thing is your body is smart and gets used to it. So most people, it goes away after the second dose. So I'm gonna, I'm, I do want your questions, but I'm gonna keep moving so I can get to some of the relapse things. I know some of you are, are here for that. Um, I wanted to, okay, we have 30 minutes. I wanted to talk about just some of the data in case you're interested. This is the ISKIA trial. That was the plenary session. That means the thing that everyone thought was the most important at ASH. Um, and what they did is they combined bisatuximab, which is another version of daratumumab, with KRD. I don't know if anyone's had carfilzomib in the room. It's another version of, it's an IV version of Belcade. It's a little bit more potent. And basically, they gave people a lot of ESA KRD. You got induction, you got a transplant, you got more after transplant, and then you got what they call light consolidation, which is really just more. Okay, so you got a lot of therapy. But what was really exciting about this is they saw really deep responses, particularly in high-risk patients. So has anyone heard of MRD? Okay, it's a way of measuring that iceberg, you know, go back to that. It's a way of measuring myeloma at the most sensitive. So the most sensitive we have is 10 to the minus six, which what that means practically is of a million cells in the bone marrow, can we pick out if there's even one myeloma cell in there? And what this is showing you is ESA-KRD is in blue, that it can have very deep responses and it's much higher than the triplet. So this is kind of more of what I'm telling you, more tends to be better. Triplets better than doublets, quads better than. And then this is showing you that not only uh, can you get deep responses, the quad is in blue, but it gets deeper with each treatment, which is also something that I'm, I'm trying to drive home. Just because you respond to induction doesn't mean we can't improve upon that, right? So induction gets you here, then transplant, then consolidation, then maintenance, et cetera. And then this is showing you that even in folks who have high risk myeloma, so folks, there are genetic changes in your myeloma cell, not genetic changes you inherited or passed on, that makes that myeloma smell, cell smarter. And um, even in those folks, like, traditionally it's harder to treat them, they did very well. You saw very high depths of response. The challenge is carfilzomib can be hard to give. And so this is why we really just stick with Belcade, okay, give DARRD, it's a very effective regimen. Okay. Very briefly on transplant ineligible. So the goal is slightly different in transplant ineligible. Again, this is more, there's certainly a patient preference you know, component to this, excuse me. Um, although we really do at least want to have a good transplant discussion with you up front because people do better with transplant. I, I hope it goes away. I know it's not an easy maneuver, but right now it's one of the strongest uh, 
weapons we have. If you're not able to do transplant, that's okay. We have very good therapies. And the idea is to get you into a place where you feel good and keep you there. Adaptive response is important, but maybe not as important as long as you feel good. And sometimes we're talking about someone who is, un, is just frail, you know, and it's hard to take a lot of therapy. So we want to make sure we can improve quality of life and give them the longest remission possible. Um, the main trial I want to talk about is the Maya regimen. So Maya looked at, again, daratumumab. So daratumumab with revlimid and dexamethasone versus revlimid and dexamethasone. Okay, so instead of pushing into a quad, we'll do it. We'll do a triplet, and let's see how it does over this doublet. And again, the important thing is if dara lan and dex or dara rev and dex, dara is not the one that gives people a hard time typically, particularly when you're 75 and plus. Dexamethasone is much harder. Revlimid is much harder. And long story short, is people did much better with the triplet. And so the Maya regimen has kind of become my go-to. We used to use a lot more what we called RVD light. Velcade can sometimes be hard in this population. You've got a lot of neuropathy and it can, it can be tricky. And so this is a good regimen, not only um, for standard risk, but also high risk. Okay, I'm gonna move into recently approved drugs and then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming. So the exciting thing about myeloma, oops, Um, is if you look, I, I thought this went back further, if you look kind of all the way to 2000, there wasn't a whole lot, right? We had something here, something there, um, but all of a sudden kind of in the late teens and 20s, it was an explosion. We had daratumumab, isatuximab, a drug called Belomav, which hopefully we'll have access to again shortly. Then we have CAR T cell therapy. We have two approved CAR T cell therapies um, in relapse refractory myeloma, Idacel and Siltacel. And now we have bispecifics, and we have many drugs whose approval is around the corner. We have three bispecifics approved. So how do these work? People have, by show of hands, people have an understanding of how CAR T cell therapy works, or would that be helpful? Okay, so CAR T cell therapy, <clears throat> the way to think about it is when you have cancer, your cancer has found a way to hide from your immune system, and your immune cells have kind of become tired. And so what we do, it's a similar process uh, in theory to stem cell transplant, where we freeze out your own cells. But instead of stem cells, which is what we use in transplant, we take out your T cells, which are our immune cells. And then we manufacture them in a lab to basically be souped up T cells, really effective T cells, that are targeted now to kill your myeloma. Okay, they recognize a protein. To date, the only ones that are approved recognize a protein called BCMA which stands for B-cell maturation antigen, which is highly expressed on myeloma. Then we give you a little bit of chemotherapy in the clinic. It's much lighter than melphalan for those of you who've had transplant. I'm not saying it's nothing, but it's, it's very different. And the goal is not necessarily to wipe out myeloma. It doesn't really have that much anti-myeloma activity. It's actually to suppress your own T cells to literally make room for all these new T cells we're about to put back into you. We then admit you to the hospital. We infuse the, the CAR T cells back into you and it looks like a transplant, it looks like a bag of blood. Usually it's less cells, so it's usually quicker. And then we watch you in the hospital for seven to 10 days, depending on the product that you get. Um, and we'll talk about the data, but with Siltacel, the average remission is three years. And even in high-risk patients, they did very well. And the exciting thing about CAR T-cell therapy for folks who um, have been on therapy for years and years and years, is there's no routine maintenance. So this is an opportunity for some folks, I just was speaking to a patient of mine earlier who's been on therapy for 16 years, to have a break, right? To have a break, get this and one and done. I'll tell you, we're studying maintenance post CAR-T, this might change. But it is a nice thing for folks who, are, who need a little bit of a break and it's effective. By specific antibodies, you can think of as off the shelf CAR-T. So these are things that we can give you right away and they're bridges. They serve as bridges between your T cells and your myeloma cells, and they say, hey, immune cell, look over here, here's a myeloma cell, you need to kill it. Right, so it's kind of different ways of waking up your immune system. We have two that target BCMA, teclistimab and, and alvernatumab, excuse me, and then we have one that targets a different protein on the surface of myeloma cells called GPRC5D, or 5D for short, and that's called talketimab. There are many other emerging biospecifics. I will tell you, um, AbV383 is going to come to Emory very soon. Alnuctimab was unfortunately, that program was abandoned. 
Um, Limbociltimab is another BCMA bispecific that's highly effective and hopefully um, will be at our disposal hopefully this year. Sevastimab is another one to mention that targets another protein on the surface of myeloma cells, FCRH5. And the reason this matters is myeloma is likely going to come back. So the more targets we have, the more targets we need, right? Because once you have a BCMA targeted therapy, once you relapse, you're then resistant to that therapy, so we need another. So the nice thing about having biospecifics that target different proteins on the surface of the myeloma cell is that we have options at relapse. That's why that matters, okay? Um, so the, the nice thing about biospecifics is they're very effective as monotherapy. Now we're looking at them in combination, but to have a single agent have an overall response rate, and when we say ORR, that means a 50% reduction, at least a 50% reduction in the amount of myeloma Okay. And to give you a comparison when daratumumab, which is super effective, changed the landscape of myeloma, when that was studied in relapse refractory myeloma, the overall response rate was 30%, 31%. So just to give you an idea, okay? Because we're always going to move it up and we're going to combine it with other things. So even in the relapse refractory space as monotherapy, the overall response rate is 63%. Um, the PFS is not as important uh, because, again, these were folks who had multiple lines of therapy and things, but the average remission was about a year, okay? So what are the side effects of these drugs? So for bispecifics, the main things that we see, and we're getting much better at mitigating these things or treating these things, cytopenia is meaning low blood counts, and those can last for a long time. They tend to get better once we debulk you, meaning once the, once the amount of myeloma in your system comes down. It tends to get better, and we have ways around it. Um, infection was a much bigger issue in the clinical trial. If you look here, the rate of any infection was 80% of patients. So what we now do is anyone on bispecifics, we give something called IVIG, which is passive antibody. We give that monthly. That has drastically reduced the amount of infection we have. You're gonna be on likely an antibiotic to help prevent infection. Um, and that really has reduced the amount of infections that we see. You're still at higher risk because we're, we're, we're um, you know, we're immune suppressing with this drug. Um, on the, on your left here, um, what we see with these T-cell engaging therapies in general is something called CRS. Now that stands for cytokine release syndrome. And basically I just think of that as a big inflammatory storm. And what happens is anytime we engage T-cells, so this happens with CAR T-cells as well, is all these active immune cells are artificially being activated at once. That causes a lot of cytokines or inflammatory markers to go up in your blood, and that can cause things like fever, shortness of breath, drop in blood pressure. With CAR T cell therapy, it's limited to that first week, and with, with biospecifics, it's usually limited to what we call the ramp up week. So instead of, because this is a problem, instead of just giving you full dose, the way we give it is we give it, each product is slightly different, but we give it in ramp up doses. So you get a tiny dose, if you do fine, we give it a bigger dose, and then the full dose. We also give medication prophylactically or preemptively to shut this down. So it's not a huge problem, um, but because of these issues and something called neurotoxicity, which can be confusion and things like that, it's been a little slower to be picked up in the community. I think some community docs would rather be kind of do the ramp up, which we're happy to do, but it's getting better and these drugs are, I see them more and more offered in the community. And then talking about uh, 5D, so this is the target that um, is targeted by talketamab, and we also have a CAR T-cell product in development from BMS. And so 5D, when you think about side effects <clears throat> for these therapies, it matters where else that protein is expressed. So 5D is expressed in malignant plasma cells, but where it's also expressed dictates the side effects that you might have. And so it's expressed um, on the <coughs> hair follicles, on oral mucosa, and nail beds. And so some of the side effects we see are rash, particularly on the palms and soles, usually at what we call desquamative, meaning like a peeling rash. It can be red, it can be painful. It can be more diffuse than that. The ones I've seen are usually limited to that. Um, and you can have nail changes or darkening of the nail. And, and very rarely I've seen nails, people lose nails. It's usually more darkening of nails, skin changes. And then the main thing people complain about is a change in taste buds which if you've ever had, if you've had that side effect with Revlimid, it, it does really affect your quality of life. If you're having a hard time eating or drinking, you become dehydrated, you lose weight, it's a problem. The way we get around it is by changing the dose. So in the clinical trials, all these drugs were given weekly. 
And what we have learned is by spacing out the dose after the initial month or two, um, people still respond once we get control of the disease, but the side effects get better. So it's something we're getting a lot better at. So I don't want you to be afraid of these drugs or effective drugs. And like anything else, the more experience we have with them, the better we are at managing their side effects. Um, Talcatamab was also very effective. So if you look over here, the overall response rate is 74% as single agent. Very impressive, okay? Um, the main side effects here, so all of these bispecifics are going to have cytopenias or, you know, we call them hematologic AEs. I'm a hematologist. Hematologic AEs don't really bother us. AEs meaning adverse events. We deal with it, right? It, it, it's part of it. But the things we worry about are down here. So infection, CRS, and then dyspusia, meaning uh, change in your taste buds, abnormal um, taste, skin toxicity, nail disorders. They're not infrequent. So if you see here, you know, this is the percentage of patients who had it. But if you look, when we, we say grade three or four, those are the really severe versions of those side effects. You're not seeing a ton of that. The caveat is there's no grade three or four dyspusia. So it's not a thing, so that's why you don't see any of it. Okay. Um, I hear someone whispering about it, but I also, that reminds me that most of the CRS we see is, is early grade, meaning fevers, maybe a little bit of drop in high blood pressure. We usually don't see severe CRS with these products. And then this is uh, magnetism 3, which is the drug l I'm sorry I didn't label it. And this is also showing you 61%. So between l we call it l TAC, and TAL, the response rates are 60 to 70%. So very impressive, okay? And survival here in SK3. Um, it's very similar. This is l very similar to TAC, infection, CRS, cytopenias. Okay, moving on to CAR T-cell therapy. I described how CAR T-cell therapy works. We have two. I'm going to focus on cell to cell. Um, the overall response rate in the top, you can see, was 98%. And remember, anytime we study these drugs, the initial you know, phase one studies are highly refractory patients who had a lot of therapy. So it's very impressive numbers. 98% of people responded. And the average remission time, the PFS, was 34.9 months. For three years, for folks who had had don't have it on here, so I don't remember, but the average line of therapy was probably six or seven. So people have a lot of therapy and they're still able to respond to this therapy. That's very impressive. Um, the, the things we worry about, there's more CRS. Again, it's usually grade one or two, but we can see three or four. And there is a good amount of infections and things like that. We've also learned to manage that better. We use IVIG, we use antibiotics, and the nice thing about CAR T is that in fact that <coughs> higher infection risk and immunosuppressive period as opposed to bispecifics is usually limited to that first six months. Things get better after that first six months. When you're getting bispecifics continually, it gets better, but it doesn't go away. <clears throat> So the, the huge change, I would say, um, another, what has changed in the last two years is now where we are allowed or able to use CAR T-cell therapy. And when I say where, I mean in your journey. So when CAR T-cell therapy was approved, it was approved for patients who had four plus lines of therapy, CARMA-3 and CAR-2-4 for Idacel and Siltacel respectively, looked at can we use these products earlier when people are less refractory, slightly more fit, and do they do better? And um, there's some issues with the study design I'm not gonna go into, but the bottom line is, yes, they do do better than standard of care therapies, and the FDA now has approved these therapies to use after two prior lines of therapy. Okay, so that's a huge shift, because I'll tell you, particularly for higher risk patients, it can be hard to get patients through those four lines in time for CAR T-cell therapy. And the difference between CAR T-cell therapy and bispecifics logistically is I need a lot more time, right? I have to apherise you, it takes four to six weeks to manufacture the cells, then I have to admit you, give you chemo, put it back in, right? So I need disease that's indolent or disease that I can control for a couple months. Whereas by specifics is you, we don't have three months, I'm gonna start this next week, okay? So just by virtue of moving it up two lines, you're already giving me a little bit more breathing, breathing space. When I say me, I mean you guys more breathing space because the earlier your myeloma is, usually the less aggressive. The more it tends to relapse, it sometimes gets a little smarter. So I don't necessarily recommend CAR T for anyone in second line. I think there's there's um, specific scenarios where I think it makes sense and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, 
<clears throat> for someone who has standard risk disease and has DARA RVD transplant rep has an eight to 10 year remission, then I put them on a DARA based regimen, they have four years. That's a well behaved myeloma, okay? I know they're responding well. I don't necessarily need to do CAR T in second line. We can have that discussion. But CAR T cell therapy is not without risks, it's not benign. You know, we do it in older folks and we do transplant, it's less intensive than transplant, but it's not nothing. And so I don't recommend it routinely for everybody, for high-risk folks, for folks who have had a hard time controlling their disease. I, I think of it more as we now have options. That's how I think of it. And then I just wanted to mention this GPRC5D CAR-T. So like I said, the more targets we have in myeloma, the more targets we need, right? So if you had a BCMA CAR-T and you responded really well, but then you relapsed, can we use the BCMA CAR-T again? Maybe, if you had a really long remission, but we could also use a CAR T cell therapy that targets something completely different, right? So this is just like talcetimab or talc. It targets 5D, but it's a CAR T cell product. And this is early, early data, but you can look um, how well people respond. The overall response rate over here is 91%. And then even in folks who've had BCMA, <clears throat> they've respond. So even if you had a BCMA bispecific or BCMA CAR T, this could still be a really effective therapy for you. And that's not surprising because 5D expression on myeloma cells is independent of BCMA. So it, it's not surprising, but it's, it's good to see. Uh, safety profile, again, it's, it's quite similar with other CAR T cell products. Okay, I caught up, good. So um, a few things I just wanted to talk about around the corner. So we talked about bispecifics. Right now, they're approved for the four plus lines, just like how CAR-T was initially. There are ongoing clinical trials that we have open at Emory currently, looking at bispecifics in combination in relapse. We have bispecifics in maintenance, so post-transplant. We have a phase three study that randomizes you to ELRA, which is a BCMA bispecific, versus Revlin, which is standard of care. <clears throat> we have CAR-T cell therapy in earlier lines. We have trials looking at um, CAR-T cell therapy versus transplant. So a randomization, you get induction and then you get CAR-T versus transplant and then maintenance. We have CAR-T cell therapy um, for folks who have a suboptimal response to transplant. So instead of Revlimid, if you didn't respond the way we wanted you to, we could go straight into a CAR-T cell. Um, and we also have CAR, we also have the 5D CAR-T. So we have newer, more novel types of CAR-T cell products um, in development. Um, those clinical trials are open at Emory. Tri-specific antibodies are on the horizon. We're, we should have that open at Emory soon, meaning bridges between 5D, BCMA, and FCRH5, okay? Um, antibody drug conjugates, Bellamaf was an antibody drug conjugate. It's a long story, I, I hope to see it back soon, but we have antibody drug conjugates with 5D. So Bellamaf targeted BCMA, this new one targets 5D, and what I mean by antibody drug conjugates, it's an antibody that has attached to it a little chemo. And so it's essentially de directly deliver chemo to your myeloma cell, okay? Uh, and then cell mods, which um, I'm gonna just touch on, and I'm happy to do more if we have time, but I wanna get to your questions. Cell mods, you can think of as the next generation or the next frontier of IMIDs. So they're more potent, IMIDs, excuse me, immunomodulatory agents are revlimid pomalidomide, or lenalidomide pomalidomide, okay? So they're the next generation. We have two, ibertamide and mesigdomide. They're highly effective, they're well tolerated and they will be in our clinics uh, before we know it. Okay, so just more and more options. Um, let's see, it is 2.05. I have a, a bunch of slides about Iber and Mezzi, but I think I'm gonna pause here, um, and I think we should do questions. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. So the question is, is there any, is there any drugs that target TP53 mutation? So um, we have some in clinical trial that seem to be more effective in, in P53. The deletion 17P, or P53, in a, in a normal environment, what that protein does, it's, I think of it as the policeman of the genome. So when, you're, when your cells are dividing, it's very common to have little mistakes. Mistakes are happening right now. But P53 and other what we call tumor suppressor genes repair that mistake so there's no DNA damage. When you have, when your myeloma cells are missing that uh, protein, you're more likely to acquire mutations and those myelomas are smarter. So the way we combat that is we change the paradigm a little bit. So we are smarter back. 
So for example, we used our RVD, but we use triplet maintenance instead of revlimid maintenance. I didn't go into maintenance as much. So instead of revlimid, which is what I would do for a standard care patient, I would add something called carfilzomib, which is another drug, or we have clinical trials. There's a, there's a clinical trial that Dr. Nuka, if any of you are Dr. Nuka's patients, he has written a clinical trial looking at Belamath, which is an antibody drug conjugate with pomalidomide. So we do, we do something different. And just like everything else in myeloma, if, you, um, if you're not responding to one, you do more. And patients who are triplet maintenance, we can convert or kind of turn those patients into standard risk patients. So sorry, I, I'm having a little hard time. I can come back. Why not thalidomide? Uh, POM is better than thal, and we often give thal when you have renal failure. So if you're diagnosed and your myeloma has affected your kidneys, thalidomide is safer than revlimid. <clears throat> so that's probably why you got it up front. Okay. Yes, I'll do this first. Is a high micro, a beta micro Good question. The question is, is a high beta-2 microglobulin diagnostic of myeloma? No. Beta-2 microglobulin tells me that your kidneys don't work. So it's any, not don't work, that you have some kidney dysfunction. So we use beta-2 microglobulin in staging myeloma because statistically, if you present with renal dysfunction, you have a higher risk myeloma. That's not really true anymore, but that's how the staging system was designed. But having a high beta-2 doesn't mean you have myeloma. It's just part of the staging. It's a risk stratification prognostic marker. Yes? Two questions, sir. Uh, plus one Q uh, bandage, is there on the horizon? There's a, yeah, great question. This is about plus one Q. Gain of one Q is also another feature. There's a lot of uh, debate about one Q, and it's, it's actual high risk. Is it, is it really high risk or not? And there's different flavors of one Q, and I'm happy to talk to you about that offline. The short answer is we don't have anything specific approved. There are clinical trials that seem to uh, early phase, uh, phase one drugs that might be slightly more effective than people with 1Q, but it's a little too early to move that out. Uh, depending on other high risk features you may or may not have, we might treat you more aggressively. But an isolated 1Q doesn't necessarily mean um, you're not gonna behave standardly. I'm happy to chat with you about that. I'm gonna do right here and then do you. Too. Yep. Um, the question was, can I share the slides? I, I would, uh, LLS has my slides, and I'm not sure if there's is there a way to do that. Um, I, I will we'll ask. Me. We'll ask. Yep. Yes. It's a great question. Why why do I need to type and cross before I get daratumumab? Is that what you're going to say? Because the way we type and cross you is we need to know what antibodies you have to um, other blood cells, and daratumumab interferes with that assay because it's an antibody. So if you get daratumumab and then we try to type and cross you, we won't be able to tell what your blood type is. And often folks with myeloma will need blood. <clears throat> so we put it in the, um, in the treatment plan now. So before you even get dara, you'll get a type and cross. Great question. Yes. Kind of circles back to my question about um, diagnosed with MDOT, increased 1% increased chance of developing multiple myeloma. What are some preventative measures? Preventative, right. You know, I, the real answer is I, I don't have good answers for you. Um, I mentioned the gut microbiome because there is some data about um, controlling the clone with plant based diet. It's very early, so I cannot tell you that it would actually change anything. We actually have a clinical trial open at Emory if you have MGUS, not if, you have, not if you're at risk, but if you have MGUS, where we give you an antibiotic for two to four weeks and we look at your gut microbiome. So we look at, um, it's an antibiotic that kills a lot of bacteria present in the gut. There's still samples before and after. <clears throat> 
And there's a study called the Promise Study out of Dana Farber that if you have, a, I believe if you have a first degree relative, you might be eligible. So I would Google it, P R O M M I S. Might now be closed, but they were sending out kits for people to send in their blood and they would screen people. And it's a larger population based study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It's a great question. Great question. The question is, are trials looking at um, getting rid of it altogether? And yes, uh, we're designing one right now. There's several different concepts going out. And basically the idea, I'm just going to skip ahead to some of the slides I want to show you if we have time. Um, the concept is we might now have enough drugs that target different uh, markers on the surface of myeloma that if we use them sequentially, kind of one after the other back to back, we can essentially eliminate the clone. And if not eliminate the clone, essentially give people a functional cure, meaning you're in such a long remission that you pass of other natural causes, so it's essentially a cure. And we are looking at that now, we hope to have that open hopefully next February at Emory, <coughs> here at Emory. Yes. Oh, hopefully a cure in our lifetime, is that what you're asking me? Absolutely, yep. Really, I, I, that's not a line. I mean, that's, that's why we do this. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, you know, I would, the question is, I live really far away. I think this is a question people have. I live really far away. I've been in remission for a few years. Do I really have to come see you guys? You know, I'm a little biased. I would, I would say yes. You know, I think the annual bone marrow is really helpful because it's more sensitive than the labs. So if we're going to see some relapse, we tend to see it on the bone marrow first. I, I, I just mentioned Eric Lee. I mentioned Eric Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think everyone's different. You do what you can do, and if you can't come, you can't come. But I. Well, the other thing you can do is have a telehealth with your doc, and talk about it. You know, we do most of us do um, Zoom visits if you live within the state of Georgia. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, it's an individualized question. You know, I think for the question is, do I need a marrow every year? Um, if you have been in a deep remission for a long time, I don't always do it every year. five year, you know, I don't do them in five year increments. Either you do them annually and you take a look, or you don't do them, would kind of be my thought. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the signal. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm happy to stick around if you guys have questions. Thanks so much for coming. Big thank you to Dr. Joseph for this very informative presentation. Uh, we truly appreciate you kindly taking the time to, to present for us today. And uh, this concludes our question and answer portion of the presentation. If you have any questions uh, following today, please visit our patient and community outreach uh, exhibitor booth right in the front, uh, located in the exhibitor hall. We have one of our local specialists there to move you along and have to take their information. Um, I would say, if you were given uh, one of these surveys, please take the time to fill this out. 
Now, if you don't have one, you can move out to the exhibit hall and grab one on your way out. Uh, please fill it out. This helps us to uh, organize the next um, next year's event. So, thank you for attending. Enjoy the event. Thank you.